Welcome to the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the front line, Surgeons Voices. With me today is a dear friend of many years, Dr. Joe Pergolesi. Dr. Pergolesi uh, spent much of his career uh, helping to create and subsequently help manage the clinical trials unit at Johns Hopkins University uh, as a member of the faculty there through 2018. He's practicing in Naples, Florida. He is internationally renowned for helping to create, run, and then disseminate information from trials relating to many subjects, including post-op nausea and vomiting, uh, including post-operative pain, including analgesics, and other areas of anesthesia with interface with what we do as surgeons. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much, Steve. Honor. Great to have you with us. And what prompted the interview today uh, is an editorial which you were invited to write in JAMA Network Open at the beginning of 2021 uh, about an article exploring the combination of gabapentin, noids, and opioids for postoperative analgesia. So before we get to your invited commentary and the article about which you were invited to comment, Give us a little background, please, on some of the issues with opioid-induced respiratory depression. Yeah, Steve. So, you know, this is a problem that we are investigating more and more on the everyday basis, particularly as we start to look at protocols like advanced recovery after surgery or ERIS, because now we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on getting patients um, ready to go home or advance quicker. And it's important to understand that when we look at the variables that allow us to do that, one of those is how comfortable our patients are after surgery, i.e. their analgesia. And in light of the CDC guidelines that came out a few years ago, uh, which were really focused towards uh, chronic pain, these have been transliterated uh, to the acute pain situation that we experience every day in, in, in the surgical theaters and postoperatively. So we've been asked to um, look at alternative ways of controlling analgesia, particularly in those um, types of surgeries that have a very high pain trajectory within the first 24 to 48 hours and manage that pain in a non-opioid fashion. And that can be very difficult because, you know, opioids um, for post-operative pain are indicated for moderate to moderately severe um, pain as, a, as monotherapy. So how do we uh, go from an opioid type of uh, utilization to a reduced opioid or opioid free situation. And there are different ways that have been explored to do this. Uh, the combination of analgesics is one of those. We would call that a multi-mechanistic analgesic combination, whereby we're using different analgesics that utilize different mechanisms for pain control in combination. And this itself opens up uh, a whole entire exciting um, myriad of opportunities for researchers, particularly our younger researchers, who, who I love to encourage to think about these things. They include preemptive analgesia, which needs to be defined. You know, when would you give this? How much uh, of a combination drug would you give ahead of time? Um, and they include perioperative use. So um, during the procedure or just after the procedure as well. And unfortunately, a lot of this information um, intuitively sounds good, right? You combine two different um, analgesics that attack pain on, on two different ways in the pain pathways, and we would expect to have some type of effect that would be additive or super additive or synergistic. But it's not that easy. Um, it's important to realize that in the preclinical models, we can use things like isobolographic determination, whereby we can mathematically look at lines of synergy uh, that can tell us if in fact, when we combine two agents, whether they will provide improved analgesia or whether they may Im 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 provide improved analgesia, but increase side effects. We don't want to be improving analgesia at the risk of uh, patients having more potential side effects. And that's why it's important to 
really look at the data when it's presented in various articles to see if we are merely decreasing opioid consumption um, or decreasing opioid consumption, improving analgesia, and um, minimizing or mitigating the side effects. In true combination therapy, multi-mechanistic analgesic combination therapy, the goal is to be able to reduce the dose of each of the agents by about a log value and combine them so that the combination of these two agents would be equal to the effect of either agent alone. And the hope is that by using that lower dose of each agent that you would decrease the dose, uh, that you would decrease the potential side effect profile. A lot of times what happens is that we use these agents at the doses that they're commonly prescribed um, for off-label indications when it comes to post-operative pain because the anticonvulsants are not indicated for post-operative pain. So now you're taking two different doses that really have never been tested and you're applying them. And this, in a sense, might go against the, the sort of... Um, background uh, understanding of combining drugs, right? Um, and unfortunately, what we've seen is that when we do do this, that uh, we, we, we may wound, wind up with larger side effects. Now, opioid-induced respiratory depression can happen uh, with an incidence, depending on the type of surgery, anywhere from 3% in the literature to, to as high as 50% in certain types of surgical populations. And it may be more common in certain patient types like those who are obese or those who suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. And these people are even more sensitive to opioids in the acute postoperative period. So it's important that as we try to move away from opioids and we still try to maintain adequate analgesia, particularly for the high pain trajectory um, types of surgical procedures, that we consider what the impact uh, will be on uh, frequent or common types of post-operative complications. So opioid-induced respiratory depression is a real problem. Um, there are uh, measures in the hospitals that try to address this, and it's, I think, part of what others like T.J. Gann under Stony Brook, um, some of the surgeons uh, in the American College are also looking at incorporating those type of endpoints into an error system so that we can advance patients, but we're advancing them appropriately and safely. Thanks very much. Outstanding explanation. Uh, it did raise a few questions, the first of which is perhaps you could describe for us the preemptive analgesia. Yeah, that's a great question, Steve, because, you know, some people would say, well, you know, what if we give the drug, you know, a week ahead of time? Uh, so example, there are some, I think, very decent studies that have looked at giving a gabapentinoid um, a, a, up to a week or even two weeks before, let's say, thoracic surgery, major thoracic surgery. And these type of preemptive analgesic models um, need to be very well defined and very well um, classified for what type of endpoints we're looking at. The question about preemptive analgesia is that's still not determined is if we start at a certain date or a certain time before surgery, how long do we continue it after surgery? And a lot of times these studies have looked at initiating uh, preemptive analgesic uh, therapy with um, non-traditional uh, uh, post-operative uh, analgesics or acute uh, pain uh, analgesics. And they have never really looked at continue them through surgery and then even towards uh, the, the post-operative rec uh, recovery period. So there's a positive in the data right now. And there's still some questions about what the proper uh, preemptive analgesic technique would be. And that's why I think, to my knowledge, there are no analgesics that are approved for preemptive analgesia. But it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's something that we need to be looking at. But how do we exactly do that? Um, there are some very good studies that looking, look at uh, placing, um, doing either interventional uh, pain procedures for those same thoracic uh, surgical candidates, uh, you know, before surgery, just before surgery in, in, the, in the holding area. There are some that would look at 
doing um, thoracic epidurals. And the question is, when do you do it? What's the regimen and how long do you continue it? Because that's ultimately how you're going to figure out if the preemptive analgesic worked. It's not just um, in the acute uh, period uh, right after in the PACU, but all the way through. So designing those trials um, and uh, getting a, a mythology that will allow you to uh, implement them um, is still something we struggle with. And that's why, again, to my knowledge, there are no analgesics that have a preemptive analgesic indication in their label. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, there are other agents that are routinely used within the ERAS protocols, and, and separately, we're going to be having some conversations uh, for this series about ERAS protocols. Uh, but two of those, acetaminophen and, and some of the uh, COX-2 inhibitors, are fairly liberally used. And perhaps you could give us your thoughts on those agents. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think first we want to start off by looking at what we try to achieve with these different um, mechanistic type of analgesic um, applications. So when we're looking at acetaminophen, um, you know, the, the actual mechanism of action is not fully defined still. And this is an agent that's been out for a long time. Um, and we have to then ask ourselves, um, you know, what is, the, what is the value of using it? And I think when we talk about acetaminophen in a perioperative um, position for adult patients, we're usually talking about the IV acetaminophen application as opposed to oral. And actually Bob Raffer and I published some studies that would um, agree on using IV acetaminophen instead of an oral agent. And a lot of it has to do with absorption in the gut um, if you give it to a patient in the holding area uh, as an oral um, agent, uh, there's going to be some delay in absorption. So you're not going to get the same type of efficacy that you would if you utilized an IV or parenteral type of uh, acetaminophen um, application. So with acetaminophen, the other thing we have to realize is that it's indicated for mild to moderate pain. So your expectations of analgesia potency are very important. That's why if you're looking at um, post-surgical situations where you have a moderate to severe uh, pain trajectory that is anticipated, uh, using an analgesic with mild to moderate potency is going to have a limitation. That's why we see very commonly that you're combining acetaminophen with other agents. And then it gets right back to the conversation we just had. Now, uh, part of the uh, acetaminophen question uh, has a lot to do with health economics and, and outcomes research. And you know what we see is sort of a, a mixed picture there, unfortunately. There are some studies that would suggest in combination with other agents, you'll be able to um, decrease the use of opioids so particularly in combination with opioids, you may decrease opioid consumption, but again, it may not improve um, post-operative outcomes. Um, so it, it's still to be determined, I think from my own uh, feeling, uh, it has shown to be useful in the reduction of opioid consumption. But overall outcomes, uh, again, these are things that are very hard to test. When you go to look at a reduction in side effects uh, between two agents, you have to design a study that that's the primary endpoint. And if the incidence of that adverse event is two to 3%, then you're gonna have a very large sample size, right? And that's what the uh, limitation for some of these studies are. And it's not just us in the clinical world that are struggling it, but that includes our regulators, even at FDA. If you notice, you haven't seen an analgesic with an opioid sparing, right, indication because that would mean in the literal sense that it's not a reduction in opioid consumption, but it's reduction in opioid related side effects. So that's why we haven't seen those type of indications with the analgesics, either the new ones or the repurposed ones. When we look at the COX-2s, again, this is a very exciting area when the, before 2006, when we had the, if you wanna call it COX-2 dilemma, where you had certain agents that were, um, uh, um, removed from the market by the sponsors. What we found is that uh, there was a lot of preemptive analgesia um, papers that were being published and concepts that were put in practice, particularly for uh, orthopedic and GYN procedures, where they would be giving 
doses of drugs like celecoxib ahead of time, either a day before or the morning of, and then the hope would be to use less um, opioids in the entire procedure. So again, an opioid sparing model that a lot of times um, was miscategorized because it really should have been a, a decrease in opioid consumption. And if you want to call it a opioid sparing from the fact of using less opioids, you have to make sure your, your nomenclature and vernacular are right. So here, what we have seen, though, again, is this trend. And it, it seems to make intuitive sense that using uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, um, whether it's selective or non-selective, um, like a COX-2, um, would make sense. And again, I think we, we just don't see... Uh, absolute definitive trial and type A studies, meaning large randomized double blind placebo controlled with greater than 100 patients in each arm that are focused to just looking at the reduction in adverse events. So this, the, the studies are still needed. I think in a practice sense, it does make a lot, it makes a lot of intuitive sense to do it, but we just have to make sure we're picking the right patients, right? Um, and that we are uh, following um, our own internal protocols uh, and measuring these type of outcomes. And real world evidence now is becoming even more important, Steve. You've always published it. Um, you've always lectured on it. And a lot of times the more esoteric investigators um, empirically would say, well, real world evidence, it's not the same. Eh, you know, in fact, it is, right? And so this is becoming more important but it's always uh, critical to evaluate that in, in, a, in, a, in a trial so that we, we have empirical data. This could not be more true than what we've seen with COVID, right? And the infectious disease part of things. How, you know, we're trying as best as we can to come up with ideas, uh, but sometimes those treatment methodologies are not uh, fully proven out. Thanks very much. Uh, as always, a wealth of information, which has significant clinical impact for all of us and, and also highlights some of the areas of research still need to be done. Uh, I wish you continued health and safety and, and look forward to uh, seeing you in person someday when this pandemic is uh, subsided. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone out there. Be safe and have a very happy 2021.